So the usual slide, which I explained in the beginning, so I don't have to explain it again. I add sort of, you know, you're free to copy, share, take pictures, blog, blah, 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 as long as you give attribution. And um, I have a disclaimer, which actually all faculty should have, especially Mike Stromberg. <laughs> he will next year. <laughs> Is that uh, I will not profit in any way, shape, or form from any of the uh, products, brands, and whatnot that I may mention. Um, that's my email address. That's my handle on Twitter. That's the, the hashtag for the workshop. I should have given this on day one, but I didn't. Sorry. And there's actually, if you want to follow what Galaxy is doing, this is the hashtag for Galaxy. So use Galaxy. So pound use Galaxy on Twitter. You can follow what all the people sort of that use Galaxy are, are saying about Galaxy. So that's a good sort of tag to follow. So one of the big things about Galaxy, sort of behind the philosophy of, and the design of Galaxy, is reproducible science. And the idea there is that it's really important for science to be reproducible, and it's very important for scientist one does experiment one, that he or she can hand it off to scientist number two, and they should be able to reproduce and get the same data. And so when you're talking about bioinformatics, um, what would be the sort of the main things, reasons why an experiment would not be reproducible? Different versions. Of software, that's one. Okay, but no more from Michelle, but that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, so that's a good one. Can't find the data. Can't find the data, yeah, that's a good one. The methods, exact methods, yeah. The sample, the data, the sample, biological samples are different. The um, some other one would be the the software, the so-called code that was available doesn't compile. I mean that's a very actually common one. That uh, you know you have software. Oh yeah, I use this package and blah, blah blah. And so you have the same version, but you didn't use the same parameters. So there's little flags, you know, sort of arguments, command line arguments you use. And so Galaxy really tries to capture all these things. And actually there's ways in Galaxy to capture the data, the tools, the versions, and everything, all the sort of the metadata, we would call it, around experiments. And so it really facilitates reproducibility of science. They, they, Galaxy hasn't figured out how to do it with the biological samples yet, but they, they're working on that. So... Um, so, the, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about um, a Galaxy, the various forms of Galaxy, the interface, getting data in and out of Galaxy, processing data. And we're going to do, in the lab, Emily is going to run uh, a next-gen uh, sequence analysis on Galaxy, which is actually going to be the same lab you just did, basically. So we're going to do the same RNA-seq analysis in Galaxy. So you'll see the pros and cons of Galaxy versus and, and, and so forth. And one of the questions that may be on the survey would be, would you consider having a next-gen workshop, and we're going to ask you after, the work, after you do this next lecture, would, would a, a next-gen sequence analysis workshop only in Galaxy, the whole workshop in Galaxy, would that be something that would be useful? And another question that might be on the workshop is, should we do a separate workshop just on RNA-seq analysis, for example, and not have that part of this workshop. Anyway, so some play. Michelle's writing the survey right now, so I'm planting some seeds. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Galaxy is also another, it's a very sort of, is considered as a pipeline tool. There are many, many pipeline tools. We've actually published one many years ago, which nobody uses anymore. Uh, which was very useful at the time. And basically, pipelines are developed, pipeline tools are developed and uh, really to fill in a gap of things that need, you know, need to be reproduced, need to be reproduced in this very similar ways and so forth. At the OICR, we actually we use uh, uh, this pipeline tool called Sequare, which is a more, it's a yes, less user-friendly, more sort of command line driven type tool <coughs> But it is a pipeline tool in the sense that it allows 
It writes sort of a metadata file, and it keeps track of all our, 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 our pipelines and the arguments and, and so forth so that we can have, we can reproduce it. But more importantly for us is so we can automate it. So we've got a thousand samples to rerun and so forth so we could be able to do it. And so actually one of the things that uh, uh, the Sequare group and, uh, and Zybin and myself are doing is actually trying to put Sequare into, which is not a command, it is a command line tool, putting it into a mod, like a, a tool in, uh, in um, Galaxy. So we're going to sort of put a pipeline within a pipeline. But that should, that should be, you know, technically it's doable. And, uh, but if you have a pipeline that works and you want to distribute it to, uh, to people, that should be possible. So, as you may have gathered so far, I'm really sort of strong advocate, and as the CBW in general, we're really strong advocates of open access, open source, and open data. And so is Galaxy. Galaxy is really trying to, um, to make things, making things and in, in, in open from a sort of literature, data, and software point of view is really key to science. And so I, I do bug our friends at Galaxy. I know, I know the developing team at Galaxy. Not all their publications are open access. And so I, I sort of give them a hard time. But this one, which is in your binder, is, and it's a really good sort of paper about the overview of Galaxy and the philosophy and, and about sort of reproducible science. They have, um, so there's different ways of, uh, of, of working with Galaxy. One of them is to use, it, use Galaxy itself, which is what we're going to do today. You can also, from their website, you can also get Galaxy, and you can run it on your own server at your own institution. <coughs> we actually, at the OICR, we have actually two versions of Galaxy. So there's a public one, and then we in-house, we have two versions. We have one that's a standalone machine, and then we have another one that's behind the cluster, which is sort of a different configuration and can handle and knows to send jobs to the cluster. And so we have, uh, and, and it's one of Ben's job to sort of make sure that that, uh, that puppy is happy and, 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 and working well. And it's not quite the same configuration. There's some tweaking involved, but the, the website is really helpful. And the folks at Galaxy are very helpful. They have actually quite a... They're a well-funded group. They have a, quite a team of, of help desk and support and so forth. And it, they were willing to send somebody to OICR to help us install in the cluster. So they, they're, they're really, uh, really keen. There's also on the website, there's lots and lots of tutorials, screencasts, and so forth. And, uh, and you can also then uh, mailing groups and so forth. So the main uh, site of... Um, uh, for Galaxy, the main, once you use, is, is basically usegalaxy.org. This is the public, uh, it has a, a cluster of about 300 cores behind it, so it's quite, uh, and there's very generous sort of disk space, not really intended for next-gen sequence analysis, but for, there's a lot of other things that Galaxy does, and this website for that is actually, and actually part of the lab today, we're going to go onto this website as well, not just the, the, the public instance of it. And um, it's uh, really uh, very, very sort of powerful and, and rich. Basically, it's a Swiss army of bioinformatics. And on the left panel, you have all the tools and, and different types of things you can uh, use to, to, to get to, uh, to analyze your data. And on the right panel is sort of your history. And so what you, all the steps you've done, where you're at, and the various data sets you get, and so forth, they all show up on the right-hand panel. And in the, in the middle panel is what's happening. And so basically, you're going, you're getting stuff, or, or doing things from the left, you click on things, it shows up in the middle panel, you do an application, and then it goes to the right column. And so you'll, we'll, we'll do that in the lab. So how many of you ever, ever, ever use Galaxy? Actually, let me put it yet. have never used Galaxy. Okay, good. Should be fun. Huh? <laughs> Sorry? That's why they're here. That's why they're here, yes. So which Galaxy? So there's a, the main Galaxy, which is the one on, on, at usegalaxy.org. That's the main one. There's the Get Galaxy, so you can install your local one. 
and then you can use Galaxy on the cloud, which is also what we're going to do today. And, um, and which one is, is the right one for you? Well, it really depends what it is you want to do. So, um, and there are actually others as well. So the others here represents to other groups have installed, have a version of Galaxy which they've made public, which have separate kinds of tools in, in it as well. And so that's what that, that last column is. But basically, if you have moderate size, so if you're in the gig size and, and sort of mag size type of files, so that's moderate. If you're in the multiple tens of gigs or hundreds of gigs or larger, that's starting to be uh, more sort of traditional sort of uh, sequencing uh, type projects and so forth. And that's more the cloud or the, your local version. And local version, of course, you can, you know, whatever you want to throw at it. So if you have, if you want to share uh, objects with others, so that any platform is able to share things with others. Uh, if your computational needs are moderate, again, so you don't need, you know, a thousand nodes or, or what have you. Um, if you have large uh, needs and large file size and so forth, the best version may be uh, the cloud. If you have a, a really uh, absolute data security requirement, the cloud is actually very secure, and of course, your local version will be very secure as well. So, the when you download Galaxy right now, it actually comes sort of preloaded with, like I said, sort of a Swiss Army knife of, of bioinformatics tools. The, they're actually the Galaxy team is actually moving to a new mod, a new mode of operation. Basically, is that they have now the, when you download Galaxy, it's sort of a more or less an empty sort of Galaxy from a tools perspective. And then what you do is then you go to the tool shed and you get the tools you need. And so they've made it easy to, for people to either contribute to the tool shed or for their developers put the tools in the tool shed and then it makes it easy for you to install the administrator of Galaxy to just get the tools they need and not sort of download the whole package. And so this is like the whole page. So this is the number of tools in the right column here of, of each sort of types of tools. And this is, if you look at the sort of next-gen sequence analysis, so it's along your page, it gives you the sort of the types of packages and, and what they do. So that's a, sort of the idea of the tool shed here. So you would, this, you would get one of these uh, tools. So the way it works in workflow is you get data, you upload your data, you manipulate the data somehow, you save it, save your output, and then you save your workflow. So you have the whole thing, which then sort of saves all of this. And then you can publish it into a page, what they call a page, which basically captures the data and the workflow into one inst a page, basically a, a, a Galaxy page, which you can then either share with your colleagues in-house or share with the world or whoever. So you can explicitly name people you want to share it with, or you can just make the, the whole page public. And so Galaxy staff have made a lot of these pages public on their website, so you can see the data, the tools, and so forth that they've done, they've used to uh, do things. So Galaxy is really an integrator of, of, of data sources. Uh, it allows you, uh, so you don't need to install and maintain a lot of tools unless you, you're, you're doing a local install. Of course, you have to get from things from the tool shed. You can maintain workflows, reuse them, and share them, uh, publish experiments. Um, and it's definitely in the next-gen space and uh, also in the cloud space. And this was, next-gen space was actually sort of, is, um, I don't want to call it an afterthought, but Galaxy would do a lot of analyses, which would be basically talk to the UCSC browser, get some, some uh, annotations, get some sequences, do some analysis, manipulate the data, and, and say that, that was a lot of the things that were people were doing at first with Galaxy. Now they're doing more and more, uh, the Galaxy team is paying much more attention to the sort of next gen space. Um, like I mentioned, reproducibility, uh, keeping history, what you did and, and, uh, and what you didn't do, what you forgot to do. Um, Galaxy also makes it easier to collaborate with people you know, down the hall or across the ocean. Um, really, and this is really at the core of Galaxy, it's really meant for biologists. It's not, 
uh, if you're a tool developer and you want to put things in, in Galaxy, that's good. But really, it's it's not meant for the people. It's not meant for the genome centers in a way, for example, that want to publish, that want to process, you know, a thousand samples. It's not sort of that doesn't have that that kind of automation. It's really meant for the biologists that are handling, you know, samp, you know, one, two, ten, twenty plus, you know, type samples. There's a lot of uh, it's a clicking sort of environment where you have to go get things, input files, mm -hmm. process, and so forth. Though all the steps you'll see, you can if you put it into a pipeline, you can automate a lot of things and you save a lot of clicking. But you, you're just pushing one sample at a time as well. So it's really uh, so it's sort of medium to small to medium scale sort of type of analyses. Um, and Galaxy, like I mentioned, is is well supported. All their stuff is open source, and uh, they've got uh, uh, really sort of active mailing lists and, and so forth. So they're really, uh, really doing well from that point of view. So they're helping biologists, funding from lots of places. And um, actually, I think this URL is out of date. I'll, I'll update that on the wiki. The, the, the one I, earlier on in my lecture notes is, is more up to date. So if I mentioned on the left side panel of all the various tools and so you can, the first one is get data. So you can actually, from within Galaxy, you can get lots of, it has links out to many data sources. Of course, the main one is you can upload a file yourself. You have on your computer or, or you have a URL and so forth. That's one way of doing it. But here are all the sort of basically the fly people, that all the various model, model organisms, human, uh, UCSC, of course, has, uh, you know, 15, 20 different organisms, um, ENCODE, MOD ENCODE, and so forth, WARM base, and, and, and all of them. And then um, a lot of the files are sort of sort of the unix -y stuff we've been doing the last couple of days are available through a, a basically a click-through type, uh, how to cut a column from a file, how to cut a row from a file, how to manipulate sort of merge two columns into a third file and so forth. All that kind of stuff we, we, we do with very nifty mm -hmm. one-line Perl scripts, Galaxy can do for you with uh, sort of push-button operation. Um, how to change case, and you know, you sort of don't want, you don't care if they're repeats or not. You want to make them all the same case. You can you sort of that kind of stuff, which is very easy to do, relatively easy to do in Unix, but is very, uh, very easy to do with, uh, um, with uh, Galaxy. Joining files, base ba uh, uh, coverage, you know, statistics, and, and all that kind of stuff is also available. Uh, like I mentioned, a lot of next gen sort of uh, tools are, are now, and this is actually, there are more tools than are actually shown here, uh, and sort of uh, fast queue manipulation and so forth are available. Um, so more next-gen sequencing tools, mapping, BWA, cufflinks, and so forth. All the things are now entering um, uh, Galaxy. So one important thing to do, whenever you start an instance of Galaxy, be it on the web, on the cloud, at, uh, at UPenn, you should always log in. And so the main thing, the main advantage you do when you log in is you're able to uh, have your histories and share them and data sets and so forth that you have access to. And so that's going to be a thing to, to remember all the time once you get into the, you start Galaxy, you know, log in and, 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 and do things. As I mentioned, so one of the main things about the UCSC browser, and I'm sure many of you have used the UCSC browser, uh, it has many eukaryotic genomes uh, from yeast to human. Um, all the annotations uh, we know about are, are usually there. Um, a lot of variation data and evolutionary relationships is really uh, powerful. Um, it has graphical, uh, the main use of, of the UCSC genome browsers to sort of have a graphical representation of the genome. The main use that Galaxy makes of the UCSC browser is actually to get data and tables. And so GTF format, we talked about GFF and, and FASTA files and so forth are all kinds of files that, that uh, Galaxy, uh, sorry, UCSC genome browser generates that Galaxy likes to get from, from them. So 
And uh, you can also upload your data to, to UCSC and show it on, on a track and share it and so forth. So all of that's possible. So this is uh, UCSC Genome Browser. Um, this is like the home page, which has access to all the, the, the various types of things that they have available. When you go to UCSC Genome Browser, by default, it shows you a human genome, uh, the latest release, which in this case is uh, um, HG19, or uh, the, research, the Genome uh, Research Consortium, uh, Human 37, which, by the way, they've announced it's almost in a year, it's going to increment to HD20. Okay, so they've warned you. So don't be upset next year when the release has changed and you know, oh, I didn't know. I told you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they've given like a year and three months notice of this change. And so it's a new build. So a new build of the human genome is has repercussions to a lot of gene prediction, a lot of coordinates. All the coordinate system have to be remapped. So from a and, and knowing which build you're you're working from is critical. At any so, if there's one type of metadata that you have always, always, always have to keep track of, is what's the reference genome I'm working from, be it human or or mouse or or deer or wolf or whatever. It's always critical to know what what version of the reference genome you're using is what the version is. And for the heavily used ones like humans and mouse, there's a standard nomenclature. But for the more obscure ones check to see what the standard nomenclature is for your community. There is one, I'm sure, and it's going to be critical to know which one it is you're working with. Because if they, there's a change in the coordinate system, then I say my gene is from you know, 2 million to 2 million 500. Uh, that's no longer true as soon as you, you have a new version of your genome. And so the, everything goes out the window all the you know, mapping RNA, uh, mapping genes, everything is, means is useless. Uh, after metrics, coordinates, the whole thing. If you don't know which genome it's based on, you're screwed. Okay, so it's very, very critical to, to know what, what, uh, which version you're at. And so if you do a simple query, in this case it was uh, RAS, KRAS, you get uh, the UCSC genes that are represented, and you click on the one, then you'll get the graphical representation, RefSeq, non-human RefSeq genes, and so forth. Uh, and this would be uh, KRAS in the, in the UCSC genome browser with um, different mRNAs, different, uh, uh, all the SNPs, and so forth. Uh, lots of, and lots of data. And if you look at the whole page from UCSC browser, basically all of these represent tracks which are shown or not shown, and most of them are hidden, uh, that are available for you to look at. And so uh, there's lots of, of configuration possible with UCSC browser. And of course, all that data is also available in tabular format. Yes? No, 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 no. So, um, so UCSC is, is not a BAM file read. It doesn't read BAM files, so per se. Uh, there are other browsers. I mean, we sh we've seen a few here. There are uh, GBrowse also reads BAM files. There's a few other browsers that, uh, yes? Yeah, so you have to have your file. So UCSC browser itself doesn't host the BAM files. If you have the BAM files on the web somewhere, and then you can make, if they're readable by the, anybody in the world, then, then you're UCSC. But it's not the best tool to look at BAM files. But how do you choose your custom track? So custom track could be your interpretation. So where, let's say where your variants are, where your SNPs are, and so forth. That's how you, you would have a custom track, yeah. And usually they're bed files. And bed files, yeah. So we'll, we'll, I'll talk a bit about that later, actually, in a couple of slides. Like this slide. <laughs> so, so one of the t so many of the file types that can output and read it are so you can read so bed files, which is their so basically the their UCSC uh, formatted file. But then there are other file formats that can generate and that are used by 
uh, become a currency, as we saw, for example, in the RNA lab, of many other tools in, in the world. So for uh, in bioinformatics, and so uh, so tab delineated, tab separated files. So I, I don't, I'm not going to show an example of that, but you imagine whatever value separated by tabs. Um, a FASTA file, which I'm sure you all know, is is the the requirements for FASTA, which was. Uh, quite interesting from a historical point. It was like the FASTA tool, which is the predecessor of BLAST, had a file format requirement for a query. So if you had to want to put in a query, actually for its database, also that it searched against, it was that you had a greater than sign and then one line. So this is actually the first two lines here is actually one line um, of anything, basically. So no format, and then your sequence, and your sequence could be nucleotide. Fast A, or it could be amino acids, and uh, and that was the only th requirement for Fast A file format, and it, it was sort of for many many years. Now with Fast Q and so forth, there's lots of more you know sort of differences and so forth. But this was a, the standard file. Most tools read Fast A file formats. That was the input for uh, uh, any query was uh, Fast A. So NCBI, so this is a Fast A from NCBI has their version of what the definition line, so this, uh, this uh, greater than sign, greater than sign followed by this. So there, this information is structured in a sort of a standard way for NCBI, but that's only enforced by NCBI, used by NCBI, and, uh, and everybody else does it differently. So, um, but so they have GI numbers, reference number, accession dot version numbers, and then a short description of what that file is. This is an example of a bed format. So there's um, three uh, required fields in bed, and then there's nine additional sort of, and you can sort of go to this page here for the, all the, the rest of the requirements. But basically, you have the chromosome number, you have um, uh, value, chromosome start, chromosome end, and so you know exactly, and not in the bed file, but you actually know which chromosome, which version of which genome we're talking about. And so uh, you know exactly where your coordinates are. And then you have some values, which could be, there's all sorts of kind of information. It could be gene structure. It could be um, annotations of other types. It could be color of the track. It could be, I did an experiment at this position, and... This is where my transcription factor binds to. So it could be chip seq data, could be all sorts of different things. And there's different ways of, of coloring things and, and so forth, which are obviously going to be used in the, uh, in the uh, graphical uh, view. As we saw earlier today, the, the, um, there's also GFF, which is sort of a, um, a very poorly, I mean, it's defined well here, but it's actually... There's GFF3, there's GFF, there's all sorts of variation. Everybody makes their own version of GFF, and unfortunately, it's not a very well sort of maintained and standard file format, except that when people talk about GFF format, uh, they talk, usually talk about these um, uh, types of annotation uh, that are going to be represented basically at a, so one line per interval. So it could be an exon, it could be a single nucleotide, SNP, it could be all sorts of, of, of different. So it could be from one nucleotide to full chromosomes and, and everything in between. And uh, GTF format has, is like GFF, plus it has these two extra fields, the gene ID value and the transcript ID value, which is sort of, this is how this is represented here. And basically it allows for uh, specifically uh, annotation of mRNAs and coding sequences. So express sequence. Which, uh, of course, we know doesn't entirely, the gene is bigger than that, right? That's a good question. What is a gene? <laughs> so where does the gene start? Not all at once. Of what? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> no. 
the bit further more five what's more five prime n of that? Five prime even more five, what's more five prime n of that? Promoter. Promoter, yes. So the five prime n of the promoter. And maybe the attenuator, and maybe sort of anything that will affect gene expression, right? So if you so what's a, a definition of a gene from a sort of a Mendelian point of view, if we take the classic definition of a gene, is a change in the DNA that causes a mutation that's observable, right? And so if you can change a piece of DNA and you can observe the impacts, so it changes the color of the peas or makes them different their shape and whatnot, that nucleotide is part of that gene, right? So the gene, yes, sir? So are you saying you have an Yes. So your gene. So yes, I am. Yeah. So so that is part of the definition of the gene, because it's testable. It's it's testable, and it is so from a DNA sort of gen bank sort of point of view. It's a bit. It's very rarely do you see that. Very rarely do you see a gene annotated sort of five megabases upstream. But technically, from a sort of a Mendelian sort of point of view, it should be. Because you know, and it could be, they may get around it and they may annotate that region of the genome as being part of that gene. But if they do, a gene is, is a single interval. That's the other sort of, uh, sort of uh, constraint there is about the definition of a gene, is that it's, 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 a, it's not, a sp you don't, um, because we haven't done the experiment, of course, of removing everything between two, two intervals to see if it affects the gene expression. But it probably would, and it would probably be part of that gene, even though it doesn't have a known function. So the, the gene interval is the whole region that is affected by phenotype X. And so um, in this definition, on the GTF definition of a gene, it's really only the mRNA and the exons, right? The exons, which are the non-coding, the UTRs, and so forth. But a gene is much, is much bigger. So Galaxy on uh, AWS, um, Amazon Web Services, there's a whole pic, yes? So you have, so each, it could be all one line. So basically you have, you'll have multiple lines describing the intervals that belong to Exxon that is part of that gene. And so that will be part of the mRNA and it will have the gene feature uh, the gene name associated. So multiple alternative splice variants will all have the same gene name. And so that's, that's the glue that sort of keeps it, the, the parts together, basically, is, is the fact they're all part of gene X. Right? Okay. It's a very important biological question. You have to remember the biology. So Galaxy on AWS. So on, on Twitter, if you do a pound, so it's, uh, everybody knows uh, what a AWS is, it's uh, Amazon Web Services. And so there's a whole page on, on how CloudMan or our cloud on, on, on Galaxy is run and, and so forth. And so that's some of the things we're going to do. So we did this already. We did this, this, all this part we did. So you have all the instructions on how, you know, then you're supposed to get this screen and this screen. So this is what, if you select four instances that they all light up and so forth, and access Galaxy, if it becomes black, then you click on it, then you get this. And then this is a coffee break. So it's the end of this lecture.